Okay. Um, so I'm just going to set up the lecture. Um, again, in this way, we're talking about how the person is in the world and our unique capacities as the human animal that we are, that we have the ability to um, engage in these abstractions and get enough distance from the immediacy of the now to contemplate things like our own mortality, our finitude, and, and even the, the ground of our own existence as it relates to like the meaning systems that we, we dwell within uh, unthinkingly. And so this opening up to, um, or this capacity, I, I guess, to encounter our situation in that way uh, opens up a, a great deal of anxiety and, uh, and existential concerns that we have to contend with in some way. So we talked about the existential givens of, of death, meaning and freedom. So that death is you know, not that one dies, but that, that I will die. So confronting the reality of one's own finitude and how that um, runs into conflict with our intuition, or our wanting to you know, carry on in, in these projects and pursuits and relationships and so on. This, this you know, I guess, uh, assumption, I guess, that it, it's not really going to end, even though we, we know that conceptually, of course, that it, it will. But we fail to take that on experientially. There's the issue of, of meaning insofar as, again, we, we um, dwell within this uh, relational whole, this uh, familiar uh, mode of references and meanings and signs and so on. And, and many of these things we take for granted, forgetting we want this to be like a stable foundation, but we forget again that much of this is, is created by, by human beings, that, that we are standing on an unstable ground, so to speak. And if we recognize that authentically, that, that creates a destabilizing sort of uh, uh, feeling. And then, of course, the problem of freedom, that if we are open in, in some limited capacities to choosing the life that we live, um, then there are existential uh, uh, feelings that, that go along with that. So uh, we talked in the last class how culture, our society can, can provide us with various symbols that speak to these lived truths and needs and longings and so on. And it can do that in a way that opens us up to the reality of our situation and gives us a, a narrative perhaps that, that will help us you know, bear this discomfort in an honorable way, in a dignified way uh, that we can see our situation in a, a relative sense and contextualized appropriately and, and take some responsibility for the lives that we're living. We can, the culture can help us do that. But I think um, what, what many people would argue from this frame is that much of the time it actually does the opposite, that culture, uh, our society provides us with distractions and psychological anesthetics that, that you know, give us a, a way of, of coping and cover over or conceal these authentic possibilities or an authentic understanding of, of our existential situation. Um, so um, we're going to focus on, on death here uh, today, but I, I drew this diagram. I don't know if, if this will make sense, but it, the idea is that our average everyday way of, of being in the world is such that we are we are taken up by the cultural interpretation. We are taken over by uh, what Heidegger refers to as, as the, the tranquilizing illusions of das man. That's the, the one or the they. So we, we say what one says or we do what one does. We look around and, and we just see how people are comporting themselves in the world and, and we just do the same. And so it unburdens us of the anxiety about you know, what we should be doing as well as you know, the, the responsibility for any authentic choice. So we get comfortably, um, I guess, uh, absorbed into the, the collective way of doing things. And, and so the life that we're living in that, if we stay in that mode, is, is unowned in a sense. You know, it's taken over by, by the, uh, the collective interpretation. So he calls this a fallen da sign. It's a fallen mode of being. And this is, again, just our average everyday way of being. And it's the case for, for all of us. Now, what happens, though, is, is that there can be life experiences that 
that rattle you or kind of awaken you to some of these existential feelings and, and, uh, and notions. And it could be something like, you know, a, a brush with death, or it could be a traumatic experience, or it just could be something, just some bizarre thing that, you know, a glitch in the matrix that just throws you out of, you know, the average everyday way of existing. And when that happens, what tends to occur is, is that you are momentarily kind of thrown out of the, 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 the comforting, kind of soothing nature of, of this average everyday way of being, and you experience a kind of anxiety, but it's not anxiety like signal anxiety in the psychodynamic sense. This is what we call existential anxiety or angst. And so there's, along with that, there's a sense of, in, in many cases, uh, uh, we experience ourselves as uh, an heimlichkeit, which is uncanniness or, or not being at home in the world or feeling like we're uprooted in some way. And so the world shows up as, as strange and peculiar, and it sort of lights up in a very different way. And there's a parallel here, if you remember back when we're talking about the ready to hand and the present at hand, remember that the present at hand shows up through a breakdown of the ready to hand, right? So if you remember the hammer, and we take up the hammer, we, we don't see it as a hammer, as just a thing, as an object. We just take it up and, and we use it as we're trying to, to fasten a board or something like that. But when the hammer breaks, it malfunctions, it cracks or something like that. Now suddenly the hammer lights up as a hammer and we see it as, as a thing, as an object that is getting in the way of, of this, you know, what we're trying to accomplish or do. There's something like that happening arguably when we experience this sort of existential breakdown that it, it throws us out of our ready to hand absorbed, you know, kind of precognitive just way of, of doing things and now the world kind of lights up in its worldhood that we can see the situation um, at, at a bit of a distance so to speak so but you're uprooted and, and there's this you know a terrible anxiety in experiencing oneself in that way but there are it, it also is as much as it uproots us it 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 reveals something too now it reveals authentically our true situation in the world. And so we have the possibility of, of an authentic way of, of, uh, of being. Uh, they're, they're, you know, as, as destabilizing as, as that is, it frees us up in a way that we can, we're now open to various choices. So arguably the, you know, it, and one, you can't stay in that state, right? Is, is uh, something I need to say as well. So to live authentically means, I think, in some ways to occasionally be able to, you know, kind of have these experiences or invite these experiences that, that will destabilize things enough that you can be reminded of the context of the life that you're living and, and make authentic choices. That's kind of what, what, we're, uh, what we would want to say. But uh, does that make sense, sort of, kind of? We'll fill in some of this stuff as we move along. I'm just going to show you a, a, a brief little video clip from a movie called uh, uh, Rosencrantz and Guildstern Are Dead. And these are two characters from Hamlet uh, that they, someone made a movie of. It'll just kind of set the mood here for us. Whatever became of the moment when one first knew about death? There must have been one. A moment. In childhood. When it first occurred to you that you don't go on forever. Must have been shattering. Stamped into one's memory. And yet, I can't remember it. It never occurred to me at all. We must be born with an intuition of mortality. Before we know the word for it. Before we know that there are words. Out we come blooded and squalling with the knowledge that for all the points of the compass there's only one direction and time is its only measure. It's a great movie if you get a chance to, to watch it. Now I don't know about this intuition of, of mortality you know, in, in a newborn but it's worth thinking about like how do we come to learn about death? Like, what is our first, 
And I think I would maybe separate, like, how do we come to, to know it, maybe, in a sense, as, as a concept, and, and how do we come to experience it as it affects our, our day-to-day lives. But what would you guys say to that? What would you, be your intuitions about that? How do we come to know death or to our first experiences in childhood, perhaps, or? I didn't really yeah, yeah. Would others agree that, that you know, we, we maybe kind of learn about it first through, I guess, the realization that other people are, are dying or have died? What would be the, the child's first experience with death, would you say? Like the average or the common everyday kind of? Like a pet, perhaps, yeah. Yeah, like a guinea pig or a goldfish or something like that. Yeah. Um, would we also say like, what about like uh, like children's books and movies? Do, are there any themes that involve death at all in, in some of those? And people are nodding. Yeah, what comes to mind? What's that? Suicide in the Disney cartoons. <laughs> a lot of suicide in yeah, the, yeah. Yeah, like their parents usually are, have died or something. Yeah, yeah, there's, so like, uh-huh. Like, I'm not familiar with that. Oh, it's real. Yeah. Yeah. So, so there, is, there is a sense, though, in which like, we, we can learn about death in the way that we learn that the sky is blue or that an octopus has eight arms or like, something like that, right? So we, we maybe know or we have some familiarity with it in that sense, but, you know, it just, like, over time, like, slowly dawns on a child, perhaps, that that it applies to, you know, people and to eventually to themselves. And, and hopefully, you know, in some way they, they've built up enough psychological defenses that they can take that on without being uh, extremely overwhelmed by it. You know, certainly some children experience death at, at a very young age and, uh, and not in a good way. And, and it is really, really difficult for them. But what about... Um, um, and we can get some intuitions about this too in, in how, how parents react to children's questions about death, right? I mean, what, what would you say is like the, the average sort of response that you think, are parents comfortable t- talking to their children about death, would you say, on average? Yeah, sort of like gloss over it or something. And maybe gloss over it or kind of subtly change the topic or something? Yep. Yeah, as well as they change the topic. Yeah, yeah. And so, I mean, part of it, I think, is, is uh, like if a parent has given a great deal of thought and consideration and has really struggled with and worked through some of those issues, then I think they would probably be more comfortable because they have a sense of how they've been able to, to deal with it. And then they're able to kind of um, break it down to a developmentally appropriate kind of response or something that might be helpful to, to a child. Uh, but what we'd say, like, I, my intuition is that I think a lot of parents, they kind of panic. And they say, well, what happened to little Sparky, you know? And then a parent, you know, because of the discomfort or, the, you know, the worry about, you know, how the child is bearing this, they might say something, well, Sparky's in heaven, sweetheart, right? Even though they might not be religious. I, I know plenty of people who have done that sort of thing. And they say, well, is that where grandma went to? Oh, yes, yes, honey, that's where grandma went to. Um, but you can talk to children about this sort of thing in, in ways that I think are, are kind of age appropriate. I remember my, my nephew, uh, I think he was only four, um, he was asking about this sort of thing. And my sister-in-law said, why don't you go talk to Brad? He's the guy to talk to about this sort of thing. <laughs> so she kind of threw me into that. And I just found myself saying, like, so you, you're worried about that? You're worried about kind of what happens? Or, uh, and. Uh, and I said, and he said, well, where do we go? And I, I said, well, I think, I don't know for sure, but I think maybe we go back to where we were before we were born, you know, which is not an unreasonable thing to say. It's not untrue, but that seemed to kind of help him in a way. I think he was like, well, I wasn't worried about where I was going to go before I was born, so maybe that's fine, right? Um, so I think there are ways we can, we can talk about that. So I'm just going to lay this out maybe in a way that um, aligns a bit more with uh, like a psychodynamic or an analytic kind of interpretation. But the idea is that, again, all humans have this instinct toward life and survival. Unlike other creatures, we can project ourselves in time. We exist in time in a very different way. 
and we anticipate future possibilities, including the, the inevitability of our own death. There's a tension between our awareness that death is certain and our natural survival instincts. As we've, we've talked about, we know that one dies in, in a generalized sense, in an abstract sense, that it happens to other people. And in an abstract way, we know that it happens to us as well. Uh, though we often sort of forget in the subjective first person or experiential sense that I will die. When we remember the limitations of our physical bodies and the threat to our existence, we naturally experience anxiety. The issue is that we are, we are part biological and, and part symbolic in, in our way of being in the world. So our bodies, in a, in a sense, can't tell the difference between an immediate threat and an anticipated threat. So there's always this, this potential burden of anxiety um, about our situation. Um, and it's just it's interesting to think about as well, or just remember, just uh, that you know we can do that mental time travel and recall things that have happened to us, you know things that were, you know quite distressing or saddening or whatever it is, and 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 we can feel things about that, right? So we, we have the we have a time machine of sorts, you know, in our ability to to do that, and and again we can imagine future possibilities, the loss of of a friend, the anticipated loss of one's parent and so on and of course we have emotional reactions to that as well. So if we experience this anxiety in its fullest and in every waking moment, arguably we wouldn't be able to function. It'd be very difficult to just even put one foot in front of the other. So if we wish to dispel this anxiety, we must find ways to deny or repress our awareness of, of our mortality. So and, and that's essentially kind of what we do. We we kind of fall into a kind of uh, avoidance or we find distractions or ways to busy our minds so that we don't really take that on in, in an experiential sense. Um, but the problem is, is that we, we get kind of caught up in the collective interpretation and, you know, we fail to have like, um, you know, the, the context, I guess, that would make life kind of meaningful. I mean, you think about this for, for a second, like what would it be like if no one ever died? You know, like if we had, uh, I'm borrowing this from Irvin Yalom, but if we have like a magic button that we could push and this magic button, when you push it, no one ever dies, no one ever gets sick, no one ever suffers physically. Um, and then, you know, we'll, we'll say for the, the heady intellectual folks in the crowd, like we don't have to deal with the problem of, of overpopulation and that sort of thing, okay? So, and we can ask ourselves like, would you push that button? You know, and if we hesitate there for a second and, and we say, OK, if we were trying to, to, to make a case like that that would be a terrible thing. What would we argue? Like, how would we present that? I think it would make as much as it would. Yeah. Well, imagine like what, what this would do. Like, so an important part of this is that, you know, what it does to our, our experience of time, right? That, that we, we go on forever in, in this, this idea. What would that do to our relationships, would you say? If no one ever died, if you could always push something off, you know, I'll do that 100 years from now. I got a century or, or two to, to deal with that. Yeah, well, we might take things for granted. We might, you know, kind of find ourselves just pushing things off. There's no sense of urgency, you know? There's no sense of urgency to apologize to this friend. You know, I can put that off for a couple of years, whatever it is. And, uh, and so it, it could lead to a kind of detachment or just kind of taking life for granted. You know? I'm going to comment on this image in just a, just a minute. Uh, so although death is everywhere in the news and our media, we see this in uh, you know, our Twitter streams, the, the news, in our movies, video games, like it's, it's everywhere. Again, it's, it's more in an abstract way or it, it's something that, that happens to someone else and it rarely touches us personally. Of course, our, our, how we, in our culture, how we experience death and, and the closeness that, that, we, that we have with, uh, with that has, has changed over the years. So people die now in hospital in these sterile little boxes and we have nurses that attend to them and take care of all the difficult things 
And um, you know, if we wanted to, we, we could just you know, show up in the evening for an hour or two and then, and then leave. And we don't have that, that sort of, I guess, that in your face experience of, of what it's like to be with someone who is, is dying. Um, people who have, uh, uh, have seen people die and, and uh, have dealt with that like within your family, you might notice that there are ways in which, um, well, first of all, like, what do you say to a person who's dying? Is there, you know, a discomfort around, around that for most people, would you say? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, like, literally, a, a part of your world is about to be just ripped away from you, right? This is a, a part of your whole life world, you know? And, uh, and that's a, a, a very, very difficult thing to, to contend with. But so one of the things that I've noticed is, is that, like, people will... Um, I don't think it's conscious, but they, they find ways to kind of busy themselves in a way and, and kind of just avoid kind of dealing with the emotional reality of what's happening. You know, so some people will do the, uh, you know, they'll, they'll just dote on, on the person who is dying and, and, you know, kind of refill waters and that sort of thing and, and steer clear of any other meaningful conversation. Some people will, will find a distraction, arguably a distraction, or it could be sometimes, in arguing with doctors and nurses and that sort of thing, you know, to feel like they're doing something, and, but it, it's possibly an, an avoidance of, of uh, the reality of what's happening. Um, so, uh, and, and yeah, and, and it's difficult to know what, what to say, you know. I, I remember when my uncle was dying when I was a boy, I remember uh, not knowing what to do or just being terrified, like, to go up to his bed and, and talk to him. And, and I said, well, what do I say? And, and someone said, well, just tell him not to be afraid. And I just remember thinking, like, my God, are you crazy? Like, that, I would be terrified. Like, that's, how do I tell someone that? You know, how can I do that? At that age, anyway, I, you know, I think I would have some different things to say now. But, so, but again, so I think there's a tendency to, to avoid, but I, if we can find ways to remind ourselves of, of death being the context within which life is, is possible, and if we can remind ourselves of, of that, you know, a lot of good things can come out of, out of it. There's the, uh, the, uh, the Latin saying, uh, memento mori, remember that you will die, right? And the, uh, centuries ago, uh, monks living in a monastery would have like a, a skull sitting on the writing desk as a reminder, you know, that a reminder of, of their finitude and so on. And um, for me, I remember a while back, this is like years ago before I even had kids, I was, I don't know what I was searching, so probably something for an earlier version of this course. And I, I saw this image and I just, I stopped and I, I looked at it and I just could not look away. And I was just transfixed with this image. And even now I, I can't even look at it for too long without becoming very emotional about it. And it, you know, so this is a, a Victorian uh, death portrait. So years ago, uh, people couldn't always afford to have pictures of their family members. And so, you know, what would happen is that if, if a family member was to die, then they would try to scrounge up the money to, to have a, a picture of them so they could better remember their loved one. And there's just something about this that, um, again, it's, it's a reminder, I think, of, of the fragility of, of life, that, you know, death comes for everyone, even sometimes the young. It doesn't judge between, you know, the, the guilty and the innocent. Um, there's a fragility to our life world, to our, our relationships. Um, and if we can keep some of that in mind, you know, it, it can maybe help us to have some humility maybe in, in how we, we act in the world, how we relate to other people. You know, when we get in an argument with someone that, that we can like maybe kind of pause from time to time and, and acknowledge the other person's humanity, that there's a person here, you know, and, and not like the enemy. In a sense, like, it, you know, recognizing and, and really feeling the reality of, of our, 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 you know, joint mortality. Like we are all in the same existential boat. We are all dying together, you know, and, and at different rates at different times or whatever, but that's, that's true. And uh, if we can remember that, then 
and that can help us in, in uh, all sorts of ways. So again, like that, that reminder can throw you out of momentarily or partially throw you out of that average everyday tranquilized state or way of being. It's sort of like a, a zombified way of, of being sometimes, you know. Um, but there are many ways that we, that we deny the reality of our own mortality. One obvious way is, is that we, for some of us, we believe that there's an ultimate rescuer, that we don't actually die, you know, that, that um, what we call death is, is actually just a, a transition phase. There's a, a resurrection or we, we, um, we get to live on in, in another life and, and an even better life than the one that we're living. We can also, you know, kind of deny or, you know, deal with this problem through uh, a belief in our own specialness, a kind of narcissistic, um, I don't know, like feeling ourselves to be, you know, so important or worthy or we're contributing to some meaningful cause in a way that will live beyond, you know, our own uh, death. And, and somehow that transcends in, in some way our, uh, our mortality concerns. I'm going to show you just a, a bunch of clips that I put together from a film called Flight from Death. And this sort of lays out um, uh, Becker's approach to thinking about some of this stuff and terror management theory in particular. Um, we're going to get into next class maybe some of the, uh, there's, there's a kind of conceptual uh, disagreement or um, difference of opinions, I guess, between like a, like a Becker kind of death denial being like the primary existential concern that, that cu culture helps us contend with uh, versus like meaning itself as, as being its own kind of existential issue that should be understood in its own right. So we'll talk about that next, next class, but for now I'm going to show you this. So as we've talked about already, uh, culture allows us to experience the world as intelligible, as stable, orderly, predictable. It provides possibilities of attaining symbolic immortality from this perspective, such as, as fame or success, however you define that within a culture or subculture, or a literal immortality in the case of uh, religious belief in, in an afterlife and whatnot. So culture also provides day-to-day -day distractions as well as was uh, illustrated in that video clip, uh, various hero systems, ways of, of feeling heroic, ways of feeling uh, significant, uh, and a way to measure yourself against other people and, and feel worthy in some way. These are symbolic templates, perhaps, that we can act out to secure a sense of personal significance. What are some of the ways that, um, that culture uh, helps us in day-to-day -day distractions, like avoiding engaging with anything meaningful, like really meaningful. What are some of the things that we can take up to, to do that? What does culture give us that contributes to the zombification of, of humanity or something? When you see somebody in like, hey, oh, you know, they're like, oh, I'm fine. Then you say, oh, I'm fine too. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's right. So there's this just, uh, why do we do that? Well, that's just what one does. Right, and so again, it's it's part of this this thing over here. Yeah, well, Heidegger suggests that our fallen mode of, of being is is characterized by by three different things. You know, one is uh, is idle talk, curiosity, and ambiguity. Right, so idle talk is uh, is kind of like what what you're saying, right? So it's it's just you know saying what one says. It's kind of like just gossip. It's just whatever is cool or hip or people are talking about. We can think about like just the stuff in the media and it's, it's going on about like what the Kardashians are up to. Like this just meaningless, you know, kind of stuff that doesn't really have any, any significant uh, impact on, on your life, you know. And so it, it's just this chat or, or uh, chatter or, or banter that, that um, just takes up uh, time and energy essentially. Um, curiosity is, is this capacity to just be drawn into, just tempted into um, what has just some mild interest or something like that, but it doesn't really bear in any meaningful way in, in your life. Um, you know, example of that would just be like web surfing, you know, that, that you just find yourself just kind of, bef before the internet there was like 
just television channel surfing, right? Like you just flick, 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 and, and not stop to take anything in. But, but web, web surfing is, is certainly an aspect of that. You know, before you know it, you're kind of watching all these YouTube videos, and you, you started with a, you know, a project on the Enlightenment or something like that. And before you know it, like 100 clicks later, you're watching you know, videos about cats or something, right? Like, um, so it, it is a kind of uh, a, a distraction, arguably. And ambiguity is, is what he what he's referring to there is that we're just so overly saturated with just content and stuff and just idle talk and, and all this sort of thing that we can no longer tell what is authentic and what is not, you know? Um, so we're drowning in this sea of, of information um, and, and get lost in it. So from Becker's point of view, the animal who finds its worth symbolically must, again, stand out, be a hero, make the biggest possible contribution, show that they count in some meaningful way. Society is uh, effectively a symbolic action system, a structure of roles, customs, rules to acquire heroism. Each culture has a different set of hero myths, like what it takes to to be a you know, significant member of that society or that culture or that subculture. And we get lost and, and you know, uh, extremely invested in, in these kind of hero projects or you know, we, again, we fall into kind of taking ourselves a little bit too seriously sometimes. We forget the relative nature maybe of, of uh, some of the meaning systems that, that we're living by. Um, and so we, we think that we're in some narcissistic sense, and we maybe wouldn't recognize this or acknowledge it, but we feel that we are better than other people, that other people are just mere cogs in the machine, right? But, but no, not me. I'm enlightened. I'm aware. My eyes are open. I see things, right? This sort of thing. And we, we, we tell this to ourselves in, in a way that, that maintains this sense of significance and, uh, and meaning. Culture provides... Um, a sense of shared meaning as well, that, that we belong to a larger collective, that we're a part of something, and, and we're part of something that, that will endure, that will last, that, that may you know, outlast ourselves perhaps even. Now these things are not necessarily you know, bad, I wanna, I wanna stress that. We, we all do this, right? It, it's just, I think, whether we, again, get, get so swallowed up in this, this interpretation of our situation that we lose sight of any authentic possibilities that might manifest and we treat other people uh, who are different from us in a very hostile way. So for the terror management theorists, war and, and violence can be interpreted as um, our cultures trying to you know, defend itself in a way or, or we want to denigrate, I guess, another culture that, that in some ways undermines our own kind of sense of, of rightness or you know, our, our belief system. So my death-denying meaning-making system, our, our culture, religion, is, is better than yours. And so we get this sort of tribalism kind of thing going on. Um, and now it's become very strange because it's not just about um, like national barriers, it, it seems, right? Like we, even within a nation, we're kind of becoming fractionated in, into these little tribal groups. And again, it seems like there's this inability to kind of see one another as, as part of a common humanity, you know, which is uh, really worrisome. Um, it's a really complicated question. I, I don't know if there's a single answer. Um, you know, like, I, I can't remember the name of the researcher, but like, there's a, a guy who, who had in, been investigating like the school shooting phenomenon and trying to make sense of that. And um, it's interesting, like you, you go on Twitter and you see what people say about that and, and it's like, uh, White privilege, toxic masculinity, that explains it all. Like, oh God, here we go. But, um, you know, I don't think there's a single answer. There's like, you know, there's certainly cases of genuine psychopathy that, that people are just wired up 
um, in a very different way. And as far as I can tell, that that seems to be that's there's a, a neural wiring issue. Like they are just not tuned into the world. It's not a repression type thing going on. So there's certainly part of that. Um, and then there's certainly a part of, like, if you believe, if, if you have a religious belief that, well, my death is actually not a death, like, I, I get to go on in an in, in afterlife, and, and there's a kind of martyrdom with that, um, and I'm fighting for this belief system, and, um, I mean, there's certainly that part, too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I think, you know, in an interesting way, like, I, I think sometimes what happens is, is that, um, I, I think Jordan Peterson kind of spoke to this in, in one of his videos, I think, but not in this way, not, uh, but that a person may find themselves so estranged from the world and, you know, the, again, they, they see the world, the, the whole, you know, totality of the world as just a, a circus show that, that needs to be extinguished. And so there's this uh, kind of desire to just annihilate the whole, just blow the whole thing up, you know. And so it's a nihilistic kind of weird. There's a really interesting scene in, uh, has anyone seen the movie Tombstone? It's a, a pretty cool movie, if, especially if you like westerns. But there's a scene in there where there's... Uh, uh, it's about Wyatt Earp and, and his friend uh, Doc Holliday, who was played by Val Kilmer. He's really awesome in, in that role. You should check it out just for that. But um, so they're trying to, you know, bring law into the town of Tombstone, and there's all these cowboys who are engaging in these violent acts and, and murder and rape and you know, kind of stealing and all this other kind of stuff. And uh, Wyatt and Doc Holliday's friends are, are killed by this guy, uh, Johnny Ringo. And, uh, and there's this moment there, there's a scene where Wyatt is, is talking to Doc Holliday, who's on his deathbed, he's, he's dying of tuberculosis. And he says, what makes a guy like, like Ringo? Like, what makes someone like that? And Doc Holliday says, a man like Johnny Ringo um, can never murder enough, rape enough, or steal enough. He's got a hole right through the middle of him and he can never fill it up. And so then Wyatt says, says, well, why does he do it? Uh, to which Doc Holliday says, revenge. For what? Being born, right? And he says it in a way that you can sense, like he knows because that's something that he struggles with himself, although he took a different path with it. But so it's, it's, yeah, it's like a revenge against all of humanity, you know, for, for people who are in this way or that this is kind of what they do, you know. So, but that's, that's not every case, you know, but I, th I think certainly that happens, that happens sometimes, yeah. So, again, there's a, there's a terror of consciously recognizing what we do to get our self-esteem. It threatens our symbols. They tend to operate outside of our explicit awareness, so we're, we're not really aware of this situation. I want to just read you a quote uh, by Jose Ortega Gasset. This is in uh, The Denial of Death. Becker's quoting him. Uh, he says, Take stock of those around you, and you will hear them talk in precise terms about themselves and their surroundings, which would seem to point to them having ideas on the matter. But start to analyze those ideas, and you will find they hardly reflect in any way the reality to which they appear to refer. And if you go deeper, you will discover that there is not even an attempt to adjust these ideas to reality. Quite the contrary. Through these notions, the individual is trying to cut off any personal vision of reality, of his own very life. For life is at the start a chaos in which one is lost. The individual suspects this, but he is frightened at finding himself face to face with this terrible reality and tries to cover it over with a curtain of fantasy where everything is clear. It does not worry him that his ideas are not true. He uses them as trenches for the defense of his existence, as scarecrows to frighten away reality. And when I first read that, I had, you know, my hair was kind of standing up on end. It, it just feels uh, so, so very true with, with much, of, much of what our situation is. But, so, 
the idea is, is that with, with each of these existential givens, we can flee from you know, confronting them. We can flee from an authentic understanding of ourselves and our situations and the context that, that frames up the, the life that we're living. And when we do that, we fall into this comfortable kind of tranquilizing state of, of the collective interpretation of just doing what, what one does in an unthinking way. But arguably what, what we would want to do, I think, you know, is, is to occasionally, and, and I'm emphasizing that, you know, that, that I think at most that's all we're able to do is occasionally try to engage in something that, that will bring about an authentic reminder of, of our of our existential situation as, and as we're talking about here today, I guess our, our I guess what Heidegger would call, um, you know, an anticipatory resoluteness in our being toward death, right? So anticipating our own finitude and, and having a steadfast kind of attitude or understanding as it, as it bears on our own interpretation of, of what we're doing in this life and how we might relate to other people. So, uh, if no one has any questions, maybe we'll wrap up there for today. Oh, yeah, go ahead. So, what about the opposite of this, where <clears throat> this little person, but you can't type thing? Like, I've heard a lot of yeah. people struggle with that. So, if there's, I would say probably fewer people do. Just oh, yeah. hold tight with, with packing up here for a sec, guys. So, uh, there's an excellent book uh, by Irvin Yalom called uh, Staring at the Sun. And you know he, he talks about how to cope with, with uh, death anxiety. It's a really great book, uh, user-friendly and whatnot. But it's kind of like a balancing act, right? So um, you know, like you basically you, you kind of intellectualize. You, you try to understand your situation a little bit more from the outside. You kind of engage in, in kind of rationalizations that might, might help, you know? Um, Like they're memes. Yeah, no, no, no. I see. I, I think. I think what that is. I think. I think they're. Yeah, they're creating a new, a new layer of things. Well, look. If if you're not, if you don't feel it in your bones, you you don't get it. Like you are not in an authentic understanding of your own mortality. Like seriously, you know. Do you feel like people who contemplate suicide are aware of this? I think okay. more so. I, so suicide is is a, a really important thing that we will spend a lot of time talking about next time. So I don't want to speak to that right now. We'll get into that maybe next time. Okay, we'll leave it at that for today.